we'll go straight into uh, our guest lecture for today. Uh, we're extremely fortunate to have uh, Cully Carson here from the USA. He is a, a professor of urology and chief of urology at uh, North Carolina. He's uh, spent a lifetime uh, working and publishing in the field of erectile dysfunction, Peyronie's disease, penile prostheses. Uh, he's won the St. Paul's Medal and is past president of the uh, Sexual Medicine Society of North America, so no better person to come and tell us about uh, his update uh, into where we are with uh, Peyronie's disease. Thank you, Colin. Good morning, and I'd, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me to come give this lecture this morning, but before I start, uh, VB asked me to give a few thoughts about the five things of, of uh, Steve Wilson, and I, I agree with many of the things he said, and playing off the first one of never implant a stranger, I think one of our biggest jobs with penile prostheses is managing expectations, and that sort of feeds into Peroni's disease as well. We need to, to make sure that the patients understand what we can deliver, that we can't give them 25 years of age again, and we can't give them a device that, that reproduces what they had to begin with. So I think that's number one. Going along with that, I think it's important to coach the patients. Coaching meanings that, that once the implant is in, having them come back, telling them how to use the device, what to expect with the device. Indeed, there's a very nice paper that was published about 10 years ago looking at IIEF scores after penile prosthesis implantation and watching those IIEF scores over a year. And it wasn't until 12 months, 12 months after the implant, that the IIEF scores were in the normal range. So we have to basically tell our patients they've got to be patient, they've got to give it some time, they've got to use the device, they've got to inflate it and deflate it, and maybe at a year, they'll be back to a normal, normal range. Antibiotic coating, I think it's important now. Both companies make an antibiotic coated device there is good data that shows that that's improved the infection risk. I think that's hugely important as far as, as, far as the implantation of, of, of penile prostheses. And finally, I think use of the vacuum erection device prior to penile prosthesis implantation is, is something that's here to stay. It helps length of penis with Peroni's patients, but even more importantly with patients after radical prostatectomy. So I think those things are, are critically important as far as as far as our penile prosthesis practice. And a lot of it is really coaching the patients, talking to the patients, and making sure they understand what they're, what they're about to, to, to have. So let's start with Peroni's disease. I'm gonna predominantly talk about some of the new things in Peroni's disease, some of the developments over the last several years, and, uh, and, and not go back to, to uh, some of the things we already know about Peroni's disease, but it's always important to start with a little history. And uh, Peroni himself uh, was not the first to talk about Peroni's disease, but indeed Fallopius in 1561 published a single, uh, a single uh, paper or a single patient that had Peroni's disease and talked about Peroni's disease uh, that, at that time. But it was really in 1743 that Peroni uh, published in the second uh, volume of the Royal College of Surgeons Annals of the Royal College of Surgeons of France, five patients that had what he called plastic induration of the penis, which he felt was caused by irritation of the penis, which is kind of what we know today, and felt that the best treatment of that condition was actually bathing in the waters of Barege in southern France. And until recently, there probably wasn't anything other than bathing in the waters of Barege that was, that was terribly helpful. So clearly, we haven't come a long way from Peroni's disease until really the last four or five years when things have changed fairly dramatically. First, uh, there's a, a nice publication by, by the, the, the Larry Lipschultz group where they looked at a group of patients that had both Peroni's disease and Dupuytren's contracture and a family history of either one of those things to see if they could drill down a little bit on what the genetic possibilities or genetic profile was. We all know that, that some of our patients with uh, Peroni's disease have family members, brothers, fathers, uncles that have Peroni's disease or they may have female relatives that have Dupuytren's contracture. And what they found in this, in this uh, small number of patients, 14 patients, was that, that, uh, that uh, there was a mutation affecting the NEL1 function of, of, uh, in 86% of the patients, and uh, that's found in only a very small portion of the population in, in general. 
And indeed, uh, they, they found that that, uh, that, that was uh, present also in, in Crohn's disease, ankylosing spondylitis, and recently found in, in, uh, in, in, in rheumatoid arthritis as well. So there probably is a genetic predisposition, and there, there, there's a multicenter study that we're involved with as well to bring more patients and more genetic profiles into this group to see if, if that can be replicated. But clearly there is some new data that genetic, uh, that, that genetic predisposition to Peyronie's disease actually does indeed exist and it can, be, it can be identified. What about the emotional impact of Peyronie's disease? Well, I think we all know that there, if, if we see patients in our practices with Peyronie's disease, that there's, there's a significant impact of, of Peyronie's on the, on the emotional well-being of the patient, his wife, and the, and the couple together. This, uh, these studies basically demonstrated significant depression, significant emotional problems in patients with Peyronie's disease. Indeed, depression in 48% of patients, in, uh, of which 21% had severe depression, was, was, uh, was uh, present in the, in the study by Nelson and colleagues. And then uh, other emotional problems, especially relationship-associated uh, issues were, were present eight times more commonly in patients with Peyronie's disease than in patients without Peyronie's disease. So it's clearly a, a, an emotional issue for our patients and something that, that we need to consider for, for taking care of these, of these people. What about testosterone and Peyronie's disease? Well, there have been a flurry of publications. The final bullet point is, is from, from our own group where uh, there's been a report of low testosterone associated with Peyronie's disease, Abe Morgenthaler's group, in his, in his uh, practice, 74% of his Peyronie's patients were de deficient in testosterone. A study from Baylor by Mo Cara showed uh, about uh, uh, a low, significantly lower testosterone in over 30% of his, his group of patients. In our own group of, of patients, we did a, an age-matched trial where we did ED without Peyronie's disease and Peyronie's disease and looked at, at uh, the, the risk of low testosterone and, and really found that they were exactly the same. They were about 21% uh, about in both groups. So it's probably the sexual dysfunction that may be the risk factor for low, low testosterone. But I think suffice it to say that if you have a Peyronie's patient, it's probably not a bad idea to check a testosterone on that individual because it may, you may find a hypogonadal situation in the patients themselves. So this is the typical patient with Peyronie's disease with, with curvature and a bit of hourglass deformity. And uh, how do you treat them? Well, there's the acute phase and then there's the, the chronic phase. And the acute phase, it's often thought and we often try to use oral medication. Well, this is kind of a list, it's a busy slide, but it's a list of all the oral medications that have been tried, or many of the oral medications that have been tried over the years for treatment of Peyronie's disease. And the problem is, is that in any, any of them that has, have a, a randomized controlled trial, there's been demonstrated no, uh, no effectiveness other than perhaps pentoxifylline and more recently, PD-5 inhibitors. There's a very nice study by Hortmut Porst from Germany which showed some advantage in his trial or in his uh, group of patients for uh, PD-5 inhibitors. That's important because there are good laboratory data from, from, uh, from UCLA that show that PD-5 inhibitors of any sort will increase the healing of fibrosis of the penis associated with Peyronie's disease in a, in a laboratory model of Peyronie's disease. And indeed, pentoxifylline is a, is a non-specific phosphodiesterase inhibitor. So perhaps that's the, the best thing to, to treat patients with, with Peyronie's disease. And a, a, a study that was just, uh, it was just presented at the, at the AUA this year looked at a group of 66 men in three groups for 12 weeks. Group one had intrale intralesional of rapamil. Group two had tadalafil five milligrams per day. Group three had both. And pain resolution, which is not really a great marker, was improved most in those patients that had, had uh, the injection plus Tadalafil. But even the patients with only Tadalafil, there was some improvement. Curvature, similarly, there was improvement in all three groups, but uh, a significant improvement in those patients that were, take, were taking daily, daily Tadalafil. Well, we really need a large trial. We really need a large randomized trial to 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 truly document the fact that, that PD-5 inhibitors are helpful. But I think we have pretty good circumstantial evidence with laboratory evidence 
and some, some uh, clinical trials that, that uh, are from individual institutions that suggest strongly that, that Tadalafil or a daily PD-5 inhibitor uh, dose may help the acute patient with Peyronie's disease. And indeed, in the U.S., uh, Tadalafil is now a generic drug, so we can get it for, for 50 cents a pill for our patients. And so it's certainly a reasonable way to, to, to treat those patients initially. Well, injection therapy has also been tried, and a number, of, a number of, of drugs have been used. The ones that have been shown to be most effective are verapamil and interferon. Small trials have demonstrated statistically significant improvement in both of those, but really the, the landmarks have changed with the introduction of, of uh, collagenase clostridium histolyticum, Zyapex or Zyaflex, uh, whichever, you, whichever you want to call it. And uh, it's, it's basically a, a, an, an enzyme, a combination of two enzymes that break down collagen. It was interestingly first uh, introduced in 1984 uh, out at, at UCLA, but really never caught on until about 10 years ago when it was, it was changed and phase two trials demonstrated some really pretty good results when associated with, with modeling of the penis. We know it works in, in Dupuytren's contracture, uh, the, the Dupuytren's results are, are really quite good. Indeed, we had a, a fellow in our own institution that was a, a, a robotics fellow that had a hard time manipulating the ro robot because of Dupuytren's contracture. He had uh, uh, treatment with, uh, with uh, Clostridium enzyme into his Dupuytren's contracture, and within 10 days, he was back operating. So clearly a better, a better outcome than the, the classic surgery that takes somewhere between six and eight weeks for patients to, to, uh, to resolve. For Peyronie's disease, the treatment protocol is well known to, to everyone, I think, in this audience. The treatment protocol is, is two, two injections within one to three days of each other. Patient then returns for modeling in the office, and we'll talk about modeling in a moment. Uh, and then comes back in six weeks to have another, another dose of medication. The IMPRESS 1 and 2 trials, which documented this, uh, this, uh, uh, this problem, had, had uh, baseline characteristics of patients in their 50s. They had penile curvature that, that, uh, that was around 50 degrees. They had a PDQ, which is the Prostate Disease Questionnaire score, which was significantly high. And they had a history of erectile dysfunction about half the time, history of prenatal trauma that was known to them specifically in about a quarter of patients, and the mean duration of Peyronie's disease right around three and a half to four years. So basically, the majority of these patients had significant bother as well as significant curvature and were, were significantly impeded in their sexual function by their Peyronie's disease. So how did this work out? Well, this, these are the two studies, IMPRESS-1, IMPRESS-2, and you can see that there's a significant improvement in, in curvature, about 35% in one and 33% in the other, compared with placebo. The question always arises, well, why did placebo get better? Because the patients in this, in the, in this trial had modeling as well as placebo, and we know that from the phase two trials that the results show that drug without modeling and placebo with modeling did exactly the same. So the modeling is clearly, clearly, clearly important in this, in this treatment, uh, treatment paradigm. And here you can see what, uh, what the results are. This is a, a, actually an Australian patient, but you can see that the curvature improves. This is about a 33% improvement. That's not a 33 degree, but 33% improvement in, in the curvature. And uh, that, that those data are, are very, <clears throat> excuse me, very durable. There were, patients were followed out to 52 weeks, and you can see that there was no, there was no uh, backsliding or no significant change to, the, to, the, to, to, to return to baseline in the patients that were treated, and indeed there was some mild and further improvement as patients got further and further from their last injection. Well, did, they, did, did the patients like this? And indeed, the PDQ data show very uh, strongly that that patient reported outcomes were significantly improved as well compared with placebo. But again, the placebo also had some improvement because of the, of the modeling, but patients uh, had a statistically significant improvement in their bother score, in their PDQ score uh, with, this, with this medication. So what about, what about adverse events? Well, the thing we worry about the most is penile fracture, and penile fracture can occur with, with this, with this uh, medication, it occurs 
uh, or it occurred in the trials, five patients in a, in, in a, in a total of 1,000 patients, so it's not very frequent, but it is one of the things we can, are concerned about. Also, penile hematoma, swelling, penile pain are all, all significant, significant outcome risks. What are some of the new things with, with, uh, with this, this medication? Well, one is uh, reported by Jesse Mills and his group from UCLA using a, a, a fan injection into a large plaque to try to treat the plaque more effectively. This is a great idea, but one of the problems with that is that the medication that we inject is only a half or a quarter of a milliliter. It's 0.25 milliliters, so it's essentially a drop. And so kind of manipulating that drop into various portions of the plaque is not only difficult, but indeed may be impossible. But I think this is a good idea for a large plaque to see if you can treat as much of the plaque as possible and, pr and provide uh, a, a better, a better uh, ultimate outcome. Probably one of the most Im important steps forward in this, in this medication, because it's very expensive, in the U.S. it's almost $2,000 per vial, so $2,000 $2, per treatment, is trying to reduce the number of treatments. Can we do that? And the, the, we only do the, the treatments that I mentioned earlier, the two, four times, because that was what the trial uh, entailed in, at, at, uh, the, that the FDA reviewed. But this is a very nice paper by David Ralph's group where they looked at, at, uh, at a modified injection technique. And here's the, here's the, the standard technique where uh, the patient gets a, an injection of, 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 uh, of, of I'm sorry, this is the standard technique, where the patient gets an injection 24 to 72 hours later, they get another injection, and then they have, have investigator plaque modeling. The modified technique is a single dose of almost twice the, the uh, previous amount, so you could do this, the, the fan technique with this. And then 20, uh, 24 to 72 hours later, the patient is shown how to do home modeling, penile stretching, maybe a vacuum pump, but no investigator modeling, so it saves two visits, essentially. And then the, the, this, uh, mo this modified uh, technique is repeated at four weeks. So you have basically at the end of, of, of four months, you have four injections rather than eight injections. So you've saved, essentially, uh, four of the injections, or in the U.S., about $8,000. So here are the results of the modified technique. Here's baseline, and then this is, this is, the, uh, this is the, the PDQ. And you can see the PDQ has, has improved in the Peyronie's disease, the penile plaque, as well as, as, well as the other, other, uh, uh, other domains of the PDQ. And in fact, also there's an improvement in, in the penile curvature itself. These are, these are the ver various baseline degrees, and then uh, how, how much improvement did they have at, at, uh, at, at the end of the procedures. And you can see that, that irrespective of the, uh, of the starting curvature, starting amount of curvature, there was a significant improvement. And so overall, this is the overall data, and, and I, I think you can see, uh, I think you probably remember that in the IMPRESS-1 and IMPRESS-2 trial, there was about a 30 to 35 percent improvement in curvature. With this modified technique, there was a 31.42 percent improvement, highly statistically significant over baseline, but very similar to the, lar the larger uh, number of injections. So probably what we can do is inject patients less often with less medication, and as long as they do the modeling or some procedure to stretch their penis, then perhaps we can have some good results. Well, penile extenders have also been used for this process. The problem with it is that the penile extenders to date have required as much as four hours per day to get improvement. Indeed, Larry Levine published a very nice paper that showed that the break point between effectiveness of penile extenders and non-effectiveness was four hours per day. Well, I don't know about you, but most people don't have time in their day to stretch their penis for four hours. You know, it just doesn't happen. So you, the kids come home and, da where's dad? Well, he's stretching his penis. So, you know, it just, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So basically, the, 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 the bio, biomedical engineers at the Mayo Clinic came up with a new design of, of, uh, of, of, of extender, which is called the Restore X. And there's some good data that, that uh, Landon Trost and colleagues have published uh, recently that showed the effectiveness of this, of this new design. And here you can see what it looks like. You can actually, you can actually uh, adjust it so that it bends the penis away from the curvature 
at the, at, after the uh, after the injection has been done, and shows very nicely that you that you could do modeling probably more effectively than than the patients do themselves. So what are the results? Well, here's the, the what they did was a, a trial where they did injection therapy by itself, injection therapy and another stretching device, and then injection therapy with the with the um, with the with the, the Restore X. And here's, here's the number of, of hours that the patients use the, the other device, either the andropenis or the, uh, the ex other extender. They use the, the Restore uh, X less than an hour per day. And what they found was, this is again, drug alone, drug plus other, drug plus Restore X. And you can see, I think very clearly, that the, uh, that the curvature was significantly improved with the Restore X and the injection therapy. So I think, you, I think this new design may be the, the best way to treat the patients. And here's the mean change in penile length as well. Patients not only got improvement in their curvature, but they got an improvement in penile length. Although the, the, uh, the amount was not huge, it was almost two centimeters, which for, for many patients with Peyronie's disease is a very significant amount of improvement in, P, in penile length. And certainly if you're gonna put a penile prosthesis into patients, two centimeters more can make the difference between satisfaction and non-satisfaction. So again, this is the, the relative change in length by, by group. And you can see with irrespective of the amount of curvature that the, 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 the injection plus the Restore X outpaced any of the other uh, any of the other groups in this particular study. One of the things everybody worries about is, 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 the, is the, the side effects or the, the outcomes of the, of the injection therapy, and these are pictures of some of the option, uh, things that we see. This is, the, I, I call this a, a beard. It's, it's a lot of, of, of swelling, hematoma. There's a blood blister, swelling, some more swelling and, 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 and bruising, and this is something that, that uh, we all experience when we're using this medication most of the time, and in fact, in all of these cases, there was re resolution of the problem and the swelling and the, and the, and the bruising within 72 hours for, for these patients. So it certainly generally uh, improves. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me, there, there's a very nice paper that came out just uh, last month looking at how to, how to, to deal with some of these, these patients in a, in a reasonably uh, organized fashion. So I think this is the, this is the most important part of it is, is C, where the patient has a hematoma. Uh, if it's mild, then reassurance. If it's moderate to severe, then corroborate with history. If the patient had a pop or snap, it occurred immediately after sexual activity associated with detumescence or expanding hematoma, then worry is, is probably a little bit more uh, reasonable. If it's unclear about any of these criteria, then one could consider an MRI and if the MRI is negative observation, if it's positive, then, then consider exploration, repairing a, a, a fracture, and, and, uh, and, and being more, more aggressive with the patient. But this kind of gives you an organized way of seeing that patient that has a, a complication or a, a, an adverse outcome, and then acting on it in an organized and, and, and reasonable way. This is the kind of MRI that you can get. Uh, this MRI shows right here where the injection was. Here's the here's the the uh, tunica albuginea that that has been broken down by the by the by the collagenase. And as long as it's as long as it's just partial and not complete, and there's not a fracture, then one doesn't have to worry about it. And indeed, a small fracture you can probably deal with uh, conservatively as well. But I think that paper gives you a very nice way of of of, of approaching patients that have. Uh, complications from from the um, from from injection therapy. Well, what about shockwave therapy? Well, there have been several trials looking at shockwave therapy, and the results have been variable. This one from from Germany showed that uh, shockwave therapy could not be recommended for treatment failure. It was a prospective, randomized, controlled trial, and really uh, showed no improvement in the in curvature and no improvement in in, in erectile function. Contrast with the, that with this Italian study where they did show not only uh, good results, but this was also a double-blind placebo-controlled trial of 100 men, 2,000 shocks to the plaque. They showed an improvement in, in the IIF score here, statistically significant, and an improvement in curvature, statistically significant. 
So where are we with, uh, with shockwave therapy? Well, a very nice study looked at that very issue with a meta-analysis looking at the three trials available and showed a slight, and that, it, that would be very slight, advantage to shockwave therapy over, over non-shockwave therapy for, uh, for, for Peyronie's disease. So I think the, 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 final, the final chapter has not been written on, on patients with Peyronie's disease and shockwave therapy. Well, this is one of the biggest dilemmas in patients with Peyronie's disease. That, that is the patient that has significant hourglass deformity. The injection therapy does not work well with hourglass deformity, nor do penile prostheses work well. They're difficult to deal with. And here you can see a, 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 an image of, 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 the, of the, the narrowing of the corpus cavernosum in this patient with, with, uh, with an hourglass deformity. So how do we approach that? Well, there's a new study that, that, uh, that suggested the so-called scratch technique. This is uh, Paul Perito and his group have come up with this. They've done it in 145 men. And what it consists of is dilating to the area of the plaque using a, 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 a hook blade knife and going up into the, to the area where the plaque is and cutting the plaque on, in, in either of the corpora cavernosa and then expanding that with the, with the penile prosthesis. And the way they did follow up on these patients is they, they had them use gentle vacuum erection device and inflation of the device postoperatively and demonstrated few postoperative complications but a significant return to normal IIEF 5 within, within uh, one year of, of, of implantation. So I think this is not obviously for the faint of heart but it certainly is something that you could consider in, in, uh, in, in, the, in the treatment of those difficult patients with with uh, Peyronie's disease and penile prosthesis, where they have a significant, uh, significant amount of, of, of hourglass deformity. Finally, you heard about the tachyseal graft a little bit earlier. We have used the tachyseal graft, and it does work nicely. It's nice because it doesn't require uh, any, any sutures, and you basically just place it over top of the, of, the, of the defect. You can do it with or without a penile implant, and it certainly, it certainly uh, works very well. Tachyseal is a collagen fleece from uh, equine collagen contains fibrin fibrinogen and thrombin. It, uh, it, once it, it becomes in contact with blood, it becomes a tissue sealant, so it really kind of sticks like glue to the area that, that, that uh, has, been, has, been, uh, has been incised, and it, its self-adhesive pro properties allow it to, to not be placed with, or not require suturing to be in its place, placement. You do have to use a little bit of extra to, to overlap the area of the, of the defect, but clearly it's a, it's, I think it's the best graft that's on the market today, and it certainly, I think, has is, is helped the, the, the surgery save time and decreases the risks of, 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 of surgery for, for Peyronie's disease. So finally, Peyronie's disease in 2019, there's growing evidence for genetic predisposition. Consider uh, testosterone deficiency in your patients. Active phase treatment, daily PD-5 inhibitors and or verapamil, probably PD-5 inhibitors are easier. Injection therapy with CCH is effective at and low morbidity modeling and, and or the Restore X may be helpful adjuncts with uh, injection therapy. And the, ad the adverse events for CCH include penile fracture but are rare. And I think having an organized paradigm of how to approach those, uh, those adverse events is important. And finally, surgery continues to be important for patients with Peyronie's disease and erectile dysfunction especially. Doing grafting, doing penile prosthesis with a scratch technique, uh, all may be helpful and things to have in your armamentarium when you're dealing with the surgical approach to patients with Peyronie's disease. So with that, I will stop and thank you very much.